honor to open this uh, Union Open Access Seminar the second day. That uh, is a day that uh, is can, that makes the bridge between the the two other events that we are hosting. So the Medonet workshop that has uh, started yesterday and is closing now, and, uh, and the Open Air Plus workshop that is starting uh, uh, this afternoon. So uh, welcome all, and uh, uh, I, I give the, the, the floor to the rector of Min University, Professor Antonio Cunha. Okay, good morning, dear Jean-Francois Duchamp from the European Commission, Rector Bernard Rantier, delegates and participants in this uh, joint workshop of the Open Air and Medonet Open Access events, dear Eloy Rodrigues. Um, of course, it's a pleasure for me to have the opportunity to address you this um, welcome words, um, taking the opportunity of uh, this joint seminar being organized at University of Minho. Um, university is uh, involved, but I would say really engaged on the open access movement um, since 2003. Uh, but uh, in fact, this is a process that uh, more and more um, is becoming part of our strategy, of the way we are organized, of the way we see ourselves as uh, a university, and uh, the way we position ourselves in the complex international context and um, also um, international context both in, um, of course, uh, in European and global terms. <coughs> um, this process um, began with, of course, uh, the, the initial adherence of the open access movement, but uh, after a, a maturation period uh, in 2010, uh, it became mandatory for the academic staff of the university to make the um, auto archive of the, or the self archive of their um, scientific production. Um, the drivers for these decisions, for this decision that, uh, as I'm trying to, to say, uh, is, our, is part of, our, of the way we are organized now, of course, um, is based on the, on the need that university, have to, university has to, um, to develop a sustainable and comprehensive uh, repository, a memory of what we produce, but um, also and mainly because uh, the university soon realized that uh, for international visibility and for our international operation, of course, with a very peculiar and particular importance in the Portuguese speaking countries, but also with, uh, um, with countries in uh, every part of the world, uh, and I should say that, for instance, we have a very strong link with Asian countries due to the, to the existence in this university of a Confucian Institute, um, and so our link with the Chinese culture and language. Um, and so this decision was based on a strategic emphasis on international visibility, but also more and more we realized that uh, open access is also a, managing, a management tool for uh, the way we evaluate and we deal with our academic human resources. And so the next step uh, that we are fully engaged is to link the, our institutional repositorium with um, 
our internal evaluation schemes uh, and uh, this uh, makes or this uh, really puts uh, the the open access or the our inter uh, repositorium gives um, uh, quite a central uh, position in the way the university is organized and I think all our academic staff feel um, quite committed to, to participate in this process. Um, of course this process took some time and although I'm speaking here of some mandatory aspects, what is the situation now in the University of Nino is that uh, this process was assumed by all, by old community as something that is considered as natural now, and so uh, all our community is really involved uh, on it. And um, although, of course, uh, we may face some difficulty here and there, the great majority of our professors, researchers, are really keen uh, in participating, in being really involved in this process. As you may know, um, this, um, to develop such a program and such strategies requires institutional, institutional commitment and um, a strategy that is adopted by the higher level uh, of the hierarchy of the university, but also, of course, this requires someone that uh, implement it and uh, put it uh, in working every day and we are very happy and we are very proud to have uh, Eloy Rodriguez with us that is the face and the I, sh I should say the heart of this process and the responsible for the, the great success that we are having with this um, movement inside the university. I do think that uh, the future will go on the consolidation and the maturation of this process. Of course, um, new areas and new opportunities are being opened. The question of the open access for research data is a very interesting uh, and, um, point and uh, giving quite opening new frontiers and new areas of uh, uh, opportunity for people that is involved in these um, aspects. And of course, we would like also to be part and to participate in pilot projects in this area, um, although we are quite convinced of uh, uh, very, very specific aspects and difficulties that we may face in this uh, domain. Um, so I think it was really a very nice idea to join these two communities of the Medoanet and the Open Access. The University of Minho is very proud to be the, the connecting point of these two groups, but the result is to have a very nice audience in this um, auditorium. And uh, as I said in the beginning, we are very proud to have you here. I hope that uh, besides the very interesting uh, discussions that you already have and you are going to have today, you take the opportunity to enjoy this region. We are in the um, region where this country started, uh, where about nine centuries ago Portugal began, uh, both in these cities of Braga, uh, that is a very Roman, a very ancient and Roman town, but also in the nearby city of Guimarães, um, considered as the cradle of the Portuguese nation, where in fact um, our first king established um, his, uh, his operation as an independent country and make this journey that um, already um, uh, has been going on with some small problems here and there for almost nine centuries. So thank you very much and enjoy University of Minho and enjoy Minho region. And uh, I now invite Jean-François Deschamps, uh, uh, Open Access Officer from uh, DG, uh, DG Research, to, to make a presentation. 
Thank you. <coughs> so first of all, I would like to uh, to say that it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here in uh, in the University of Minu, which is uh, very active on open access in uh, in Europe and certainly uh, an, insp an inspiration for um, uh, for many many of us. It's also very good to. Uh, um, talk to you today between um, two days, uh, one dedicated yesterday to the project uh, Medouanet and uh, tomorrow uh, discussions dedicated rather to uh, Open Air, Open Air Plus. Uh, those are two projects funded by the, the European Commission uh, that are uh, also I think excellent examples of uh, what can be achieved uh, in, in FP7 and with, uh, with our common money, basically. I have about 15, 20 minutes to uh, give you just a flavor of the situation regarding open access in Europe. And um, we're going to start without, uh, without delay. I would like to start by stating who we are as the European Commission. It's, uh, it's a big house. It's much more than uh, the building which is pictured behind me. Um, if we consider open access, let's say that we wear three different types of hat. We are a policy maker, we are also a funding agency, and we are a capacity builder. Policy maker because we can propose legislation, uh, of course always legiferating with, uh, with other institutions, the Council and the European Parliament. We can also invite member states to, uh, to act in a field or the other particularly in open access. We are, of course, a funding agency. You know that from a program seven and uh, next year, Horizon 2020. And capacity builder, this is also the, uh, the scope of uh, the objective of financing projects. Uh, should they be in infrastructures like uh, open air and open air plus, or in the work program in social sciences, uh, which is called Science and Society, uh, the, the remit of the project Medoanet. It's also interesting to, um, to show some faces in order to memorize how complicated we can be because when it comes to open access, as you may know, there are two different departments working on it. The, f the first one is, um, I think, excuse me, this is my old presentation. It's not, yeah, because I have some, uh, I mean, the, the, the one that I did yesterday and I did another one is slightly shorter and I have put some uh, citations. Yeah. Anyway, uh, this slide is, was more or less the same, just to explain that we have, um, so those two ladies picture here, the Vice President Nelly Cruz, who is responsible for the digital agenda. Yeah, maybe I will stop. It should be called Reve, like Revision. No. This one? Yeah, here is yours. Seven. No, uh, I, that's the one that I emailed yesterday. Oh, okay. I have it. I'm sorry for the delay. Um, no. Here's one more pair. I have one. I have to take it in my bag. I have it on the. Okay. I'm really sorry for that. I have a pen. In this side, okay. I think it should be like that. So I wanted to uh, to uh, gain some time by making something shorter. Um, yeah, and that should be this one. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Uh, let's here. Yeah, I know. It's okay. okay, let's recap. Yes. 
So, because I just wanted on, on that slide to make two, um, two citations of the two leading ladies, uh, our two big bosses on, on open access. So, as I was saying, there is Vice, Vice President Nelly Cruz, who is responsible for digital agenda, that includes also um, policy, policies on, on internet, open data, etc. So, it's quite general and quite horizontal. And you have Commissioner Morgan Queen, responsible for research innovation. So if you want, it is more vertical and focusing on uh, researchers and innovative industries. I just, put two, I just put two citations just to highlight also the fact that in policy making, it's very important to have um, leaders or people, especially in your, in your management, that can drive the ideas and that uh, show the visibility also towards uh, stakeholders. So why are we working on open access? It's because we have basically one big objective, which is simple. We just want to optimize the impact of publicly funded scientific research. At our own level, of course, with the money that is given by the member states to the European Commission to run the framework programs, but also at the member state level for all the uh, nationally funded uh, research, because of course no one is working independently from the other. As researchers, you may work on some uh, FP7 projects, but also on some other projects funded nationally. What is the, impact, the expected impact of such objective? Accelerating uh, innovation, this is uh, rather economic growth. As any research bill on previous results, the idea is to have uh, a better science, but also to avoid duplication, that is to have a science that is more efficient, and also basically to um, improve the transparency of the whole process that is involving citizens, the society, and the, uh, those representing citizens. So having this in mind, having this objective in mind, one of the ways to get there is open access. So open access, we understand it as online access at no charge to the user. Of course, it is much more than that. But open access to peer-reviewed scientific publications and also research data. There are two non-exclusive main ways as you know, business models, gold open access and green open access. I'm going to spend too much time on this. So we have an objective. What, is, uh, well, what are the benefits that we uh, can expect from that? Well, that the results of publicly funded research are disseminated more broadly and in a faster way, again, for the benefit of everyone, that is the researchers, innovative industries, the citizens, all of us, and those who are, that are representing us. But also what is very important for us at the European Commission level is to promote the idea of equal access across Europe and beyond. You, may, you might be a very lucky researcher or PhD student in the University of Minou, but when it comes to open access, but it might not be the same in other um, universities in Portugal as it might be not the same in other universities in, in Europe. And uh, as uh, research is also international, you might be here, maybe not Portuguese, but foreign, you're studying here. And you can also be a very unlucky Portuguese PhD or professor somewhere in a European university where you are not as lucky as, as you can be in, uh, in this uh, mini university. Uh, what is also important, third point with, uh, with open access, is to try as much as possible to bring down the cost of dissemination of course, without sacrificing quality. So in concrete, what are the European Commission will try to do is to develop open access and to implement it, of course, in our framework program. It's also to encourage uh, national initiatives, so talk to the member states, 27 member states, and because we don't want member states, no one wants member states to work completely independently from one another, try as much as we can as European Commission to contribute to the coordination among the member states. Open access in FP7, just to give you a flavor, we have, as uh, some of you may know, the, uh, the pilot that we started in 2008 on open access to publications. 
in uh, the framework program seven uh, gold open access publishing costs for instance eligible whether you are part of the pilot or not the european research council they also have their own guidelines slightly different from with slightly different um, focus than, uh, than us but uh, very active also on open access and then you have projects such as open air and infrastructure or meadow net in science and society because it's very important also when you do policy making to have also a connection with the reality plus also to finance uh, projects that can uh, make a difference you have probably probably heard of uh, um, a set of documents that we have um, that the European Commission has adopted in uh, July last year. One is a very general document called the Communication on the European Research Area. I will just commit to it with the next slide. And the two others, we call them uh, informally with the colleagues, the Scientific Information Package. One is a communication. So a communication is a document where the Commission says something, and in, in that case, we. Um, we presented our idea for open access in Horizon 2020. And the second document, it's a bit more structured, it's a recommendation to the member states. So basically it's uh, it just uh, advice, if you want, to, uh, to the member states, our opinion, but this is not a binding document. It's not like a directive, for instance. So what about um, the first document that I mentioned, the communication on the era? So the what we call the ERA, the European Research Area, it's this concept based on, in, on the internal market in which researchers, but also the scientific knowledge and the technology circulate freely. It's been on the Commission agenda for a long time. It's finally taking uh, some shape now. Without entering to the details, there are five priority areas, and one of them is called optimal circulation, access to, and transfer of scientific knowledge. And this is where you find also references to open access. And the way the communication on the European Research Area has been um, articulated is around joint statement by five stakeholder, or stakeholders organizations, and I have named them. They are EARTO, Nordforsk, Science Europe, LERU, and uh, the EWA. It's very important that those five different stakeholders that represent universities, uh, um, research funders, etc., have made some formal commitments to work on open access. So this is something also maybe in your work, in your advo advocacy work you can um, um, refer to when you, when you talk to them or you can just think of those, um, those stakeholder organizations if you need some support. The second document is the communication. So uh, what the European Commission uh, proposed to do for Horizon 2020 when it comes to open access. On the left side of the slide, you see the situation as it stands now with FP7. That is, we have an, uh, uh, the open access pilot in FP7, as I said, that started in 2008. The concept is an obligation to deposit uh, manuscripts and to make the best effort to provide open access. It concerns seven research areas, only peer-reviewed publications. When it comes to green open access, the allowed embargo is six to 12 months. And uh, as I said, a little bit uh, anyway, outside of the remit of the pilot for all the projects since the beginning of FP7, the gold open access publishing costs are eligible while the project runs, that is during the, the time of the, of the grant agreement. What we have proposed in uh, November 2011, when we, we made a, the full set of, uh, of documents to present ours in 2020 was to have uh, a mandate <coughs> for open access and then an obligation to provide open access in all areas of Horizon 2020, still talking about the peer-reviewed publications, although um, we said and we're working on it, uh, going to have a pilot on open access to data. When it comes to uh, publishing cost, of course, they, uh, we want them to continue to be eligible in Horizon 2020 during the time of the grant. We also committed ourselves, we 
put black and white, that we would explore the feasibility also to reimburse gold open access publishing costs after the grant agreement has expired, which is not easy because uh, legally uh, and from also management point of view, we enter into lots of difficulties. We have not found the, um, the added solution. We will see if we, if we find it. So to recap what's happening with Horizon 2020, as I said, the proposal was made in November 2011. There are many references to open access. The pilot to data is maybe the main idea. What is happening now is that uh, the Council, that is the, the Member States, and the European Parliament, both institutions have made lots of amendments, hundreds and hundreds of amendments on all the uh, legal text of Horizon 2020. They have entered so-called trialogues, so it's not dialogues, but it's trialogues, to try to, um, to coordinate the, the, the proposed amendments, the two institutions plus the Commission. This is a process that should continue still for a couple of months, I think, but in any, end, in any case, by the end of 2013, the, uh, all the legislative acts for Horizon 2020 should be adopted so that the next form of program can start next year. The recommendation to member states, and here there's also a hyperlink on the presentation for the recommendation in Portuguese, as an official document, it's been translated into all EU languages, is a document where basically we encourage member states to define policies and to implement them in the following, uh, in, in the areas listed here. Why? Because we want a certain consistency, as I said in the beginning of this presentation, between Horizon 2020, what we do, and what member states are also doing. Because again, as researchers, PhD students, etc., you travel, you work with different, um, in, in different uni universes, I would say. What is also very important, what we asked also member states in this recommendation, was also to give us names of people or services in the various ministers, because it might be difficult for you to identify our little team working on open access in the European Commission because it's such a big house, but it's the same for us in the 27 member, uh, member states. It's not easy to understand who is working on open access. So in summary, my last two slides, open access is just a means to improve knowledge circulation. We always like to insist that not all member states are the same, and this is why we continue the promotion of both green and gold open access measures. We still want to insist open access to publication should be a general principle in Horizon 2020, and we believe that it should be mandatory, although some member states think it should not. Um, then, of course, we believe that both routes in Horizon 2020 should be valid and they should be complementary. We also insist on the fact that open access should be effective, should be affordable, competitive, sustainable for everyone, in particular researchers and innovative businesses. Open access is not isolated from a bigger picture and from some technical problems, I might say. So the next challenges, of course, are open access to data, but um, also certainly alternative metrics uh, as a way also to to measure the impact of, uh, of a publication in a career of, uh, of an academic. And also a big challenge for us this year, for all of us who are interested in open access, is uh, what is being prepared in the Commission, not in our services, in an initiative called Licenses for Europe, and that concerns text and data mining. In summary, we need you, because what we do at our level is one thing, but we are all connected, European Commission member states, all those open access communities. If you want to have more details, of course, I like to uh, put the, uh, the websites of OpenAir and Murdoanet as sources of reference. And I like to say we, uh, when I talk about, uh, about our little team, we are two people working in so-called Data General for Research Innovation and one person uh, working uh, in uh, so-called DG Connect, Information Society and the Media. And uh, that's all, I finished my talk here. I'm going to be here for the whole day anyway, so if you have questions now, or if you don't have the time, I'm here for the whole day. Thank you. As we are running a little bit late, I will uh, 
uh, uh, sorry to John Francois, but he, he will be around so uh, can take questions on the coffee break. And we will start immediately the, the second uh, session. We just need to make a, a, a small technical uh, change here, but we'll start in two minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.